with all that is taught in the Bible, which there's so much that's taught in the Bible, the main thing that Christians tend to talk about is sin and the death of God. Like that just sounds kind of dour. Can we kind of like talk about happier things sometimes? Why do we have to talk about the cross all the time and blood? Why do Christians make such a big deal about sin? And why do Christians make such a big deal about the cross? Right? Um, My guess is you've sort of wrestled with that idea. Um, Maybe you've wondered, as again I have, um, with all that is taught in the Bible, which there's so much that's taught in the Bible, the main thing that Christians tend to talk about is sin and the death of God. Like, that just sounds kind of dour. Can we kind of, like, talk about happier things sometimes? Why do we have to talk about the cross all the time and blood? Um, I mentioned this uh, maybe a year or two ago in a sermon, that when I was leading uh, campus ministry in Virginia, there was a young man who I invited to come to our large group meeting, and he had never been around Christians before. And he came, and then he and I got together for lunch the next week, and I said, hey, what do you think about this large group meeting? And he said, man, y'all sing about blood a lot. Do you know how weird that is? And I was like, it is kind of weird, I guess. I don't think about it as much because it's so common. But as soon as you begin to think about it, you actually think that is kind of strange. That's not normal. I mean, talking about the cross a lot is frankly talking about something that is very violent. It was a torture instrument. Um, again, when we lived in Richmond, I think maybe I've mentioned this before. I don't, I don't know if I have. There was a seminary professor at the local Presbyterian seminary in Richmond, which, by the way, is not the same Presbyterian denomination as this church. Um, and she wrote an op-ed piece in the Richmond Times-Dispatch And she was actually arguing that the the cross should not be the symbol of Christian faith. And why? She said, it is simply too violent. And we have gloried in a torture instrument. And this should not be the case. Christianity is is a religion of nurture and love. It's about loving your neighbor and loving God. Loving your neighbor as yourself. You need to love yourself. And so she said, we need to get rid of this symbol of Christian faith as the cross. And instead, she suggested that it should be a lactating tit. Because it is a symbol of motherly nurture. I kid you not. That's a theologian writing that. So, I mean, in some ways this begs the question, why do we make such a big deal about the suffering of God? This violent act, right? Why do we do this? Um, Let me first say, one of the reasons why we do this is because Jesus did. These are the last words, at least in the Gospel of Luke, that he's leaving his disciples with. How do I want you to think about what I did? And I want you to think about that. um, I mean, he could have summed up his ministry in all kinds of other ways. You know, at the very end, he could have said, think back on my miracles. How I, you know, gave sight to the blind and healed the lame. Make that the thing. Maybe he could have said, do y'all remember all the great teachings I gave you? When I fed the 5,000. When I gave the Sermon on the Mount. Make that the main thing. Instead, at the very end of Jesus' life, he is saying, you will not understand the scriptures and you will not understand me unless you understand my suffering and my resurrection. So part of the reason why we make the cross such a big deal and sin such a big deal is because Jesus does. Okay? He says that if you're to rightly understand me, you must understand these things. Um, But the other thing is that Uh, why this is so important is because we actually deeply, deeply need forgiveness. Because sin is actually such a huge deal. Our sins and the offense that they are to God have to be dealt with. Um, And I read this actually from my my pastor growing up, and I thought this was really helpful. He said, um, 
fundamentally, every uh, human life is primarily and essentially a moral affair, a moral state. This, this may seem challenging to you, or maybe it just seems like it, that leads towards just being judgmental, but let's think about this, okay? Every human life is measured by whether uh, they do right or wrong. And I know that it's common in, in our world to think that human life is largely measured by whether or not you're famous or popular or how much money you've acquired or what kind of job you have. I mean, just think about all the ways that we measure other people, right? Um, how happy you are, how influential you are, how intelligent you are. Um, but it's not those. In fact, the Bible again and again doesn't draw a lot of attention to those kinds of things. It really doesn't. And the the truth is that for the most part, we actually interact with other people largely by assessing whether or not they do good or they do wrong. That's how we engage with politics too, right? Like what is the good life that we're aiming for and are we accomplishing it or not? Um, God says again and again that life has to do with whether or not we are good in the ways that he defines it. Good in the sense of obedience to his commandments. Good in the sense of loving him and loving our neighbors. Good in the sense of honest, sincere, pure, humble, and devout. You mean like, meaning deep, deep down, right? Deep down goodness. And the thing is, and this is what the Bible teaches, and I think if you, are, uh, if, if you can be honest with yourself, you know that this is true of you. From the very beginning to the Bible to the very end of the Bible, the story of human life instead is, the, uh, is a story of misbehavior, a story of unkindness, a story of infidelity to God and to one another, a, sto- a story of dishonesty, even with ourselves. We can't even be honest with ourselves, let alone other people and let alone God. A, a story of impurity, a, sto- a story of pride and stinginess and hypocrisy and hatred and just all this stuff that we go, something has to be dealt with and we're participants in all that. As Dan James often tells us when he leads the liturgy, he says, we're we're complicit with the problems of the world. What the Bible says is that all of this sin, all this rebellion against God, demands death. I want you to think back again to Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve say, hey, we we can take care of this whole sin thing and this whole shame thing. Let's just sew some fig leaves together and hide And when God comes to them and he calls them out from their hiding, what he does is he actually covers them in skin because he says sin demands death. Rebellion against God demands death. God should just do away with these rebels would be the just thing in a way. But the message of Jesus is that he suffered for you. That's what he says that forgiveness of sins and repentance might be proclaimed and received. This is Jesus' emphasis, okay? This is not Peter making something up. Jesus is saying, what I want you to get at the end of my life, the very last words I'm going to leave with you in Luke, is that I suffered that that the forgiveness of sins might take place, that you might repent. 